What an amazing round of applause for the school just coming in. Hello, it's very nice to see you. Very nice to see all of you, in fact, uh, and welcome to the National Concert Hall. My name is Tom, this is our conductor David, and this is your very own National Symphony Orchestra! So, our programme for you today is inspired by the learning outcomes for the Junior Certificate as you're studying music. And we'll sort of go in and out of the various things that you have to learn in order to pass your exam. And we'll do it with a number of different pieces of music. Now, the first one is by a composer called Lily Boulanger, a lady who was alive at the beginning of the 20th century. She wasn't very well, she had a very short life, and she spent most of it indoors, trying to avoid getting cold. She had terrible problems with her lungs. Now, this is a piece of music appropriate for today. It's called A Spring Morning. And it is, well, it's a spring afternoon now, but let's imagine it's two hours earlier in the day. Now, Boulanger is an impressionist composer, which means that sort of the lines of her music are slightly blurred. So if you think of it from a painting point of view, if I were a painter, and I'm not, and if I was to paint a portrait of David, I would ask him to sort of adopt a conductor's-like stance on the podium like that, and I would take out my easel, and I'd have him stand there for hours and hours and hours. And what I would produce, if I could draw, would be a perfect replica of him on the podium there. But if I was an impressionist, then I would look at him from many, many different angles. And, you know, we'd look at the way the light came through, and I'd see him at different times of day, and I'd look at him from over there and from over here. And what I would create would be a slightly blurred image but a view of David at various points in the day, at various moments in his conducting life. And that's what Boulanger does with this piece of music. It's not an exact description of a spring morning. It's not the case of, I woke up, I went outside, I saw trees and I walked my dog. You know, it's more, well, spring feels a bit like this. And the trees might look like that. And the sun could have been shining through there. And maybe the daffodils were coming up, but they were slightly blurred because there was something else around them. So a view, a memory, an impression of a spring morning on a spring afternoon. Thank you. 
So for me, what's amazing is that that description of a spring morning is done with just 12 notes. I mean, that's literally all we can play. It's all we got, 12 notes. You know, if you're a writer, you've got 26 letters in the alphabet. We have 12 notes. And we can adjust the shape, the direction, the, the order we put those notes in to create different melodies. And, and then we can color them in different ways by playing them on different instruments. Because the same 12 notes played on a cello would sound completely different to those notes played on the flute. So when an orchestrator or a composer comes to looking at this piece, they have to think of the orchestra like palettes or paints on a palette and think how they blend them together to create different sounds and emotions. Because music can be colored differently, it can be phrased differently to mean different things. So if I take a simple sentence, if I just say, mmm, cakes for tea, say that back. Right, so you sound really excited. Oh. Cakes for tea, like, you know, why I don't want cakes for tea. Or you could be excited, you go, hmm, cakes for tea. Or you could go, mm, cakes for tea. You know, you can change it depending on how we lean on different words in that sentence. And we can do that with music too. We can lean on notes in a different way and give it different feeling. And then we can color it differently as well. I'll show you what I mean. If we take something as simple as my name, Tom Redman, okay, and turn that into a tone row, into a melody, it could sound like this. T, R, E, D, M, O, N, D. T Redman as a melody. Now, if we add more voices, then that melody has harmony. And it's already more interesting to listen to. If we add movement as well, then it starts to have texture too. And it's as if my name is becoming three-dimensional. But you could look into it from different angles. And then we could colour it in by adding the woodwind section. And it's like there's rainbows of sound coming out of my name. But then, if I wanted to feel brave, then I'd have my name played by the brass section. That sound, no sound, is like the 13th note of the orchestra. It starts to feel uncomfortable. No one wants to sit still in a silent room because there's an awkwardness to it. And after a while, we start to feel afraid. It becomes icy. A tremolo in the strings, a mysterious sound of the celeste, a horrible, terrifying chill to my name. And if we hear it, played by just four musicians. It's like all the color, all the life has been taken away from what was so exciting before. So we can use music 
to think. Play my name as a big, long series of chords. The harp reminding us of something, helping us remember what it was that was there before. makes us question what it is we need to bring it all back to life again. And what we need is percussion. Because percussion gives us rhythm and energy and drive. And if we add the brass, we start to feel invincible again. notes in the violin gives us a feeling of momentum and determination until we put the whole thing back together again. So that's what you can do with a name, something as simple as a name. So if you then think you've got the entire world, you've got your entire imagination, you can do anything with music if you shape it and colour it the right way. So our next piece is a very different inspiration to a name. This is music by a composer called Florence Price, a trailblazing composer, the first African-American woman to have music performed by one of the major symphony orchestras in America. In the 1930s, the Chicago Symphony Orchestra played her first symphony for the first time. And it really, really it made her arrive. That was her big moment. And then she continued to write more symphonies after that. Now, the inspiration for this music came from many, many things that she had heard before. But one movement, the one we're going to play for you now, came from the history of African Americans, the history of slavery. This is music called a juba dance, and this was a rhythm, a dance that used to be used on plantations when, when slaves weren't allowed instruments, for the fear that they would use them to communicate with one another. So instead, rhythm and dance came in different forms, and that was the way people came together. And the original movement, the original rhythm for this, came from a simple series of hand movements, and I want you to try them. Okay, so hands on the side of your leg, like that. Chest. Back of the hands on the front of the leg, and then side of the leg. Now speed it up. Faster. After three. One, two, three. Fortunately, the National Symphony Orchestra has more rhythm and determination to play this music than your attempt then uh, at doing that did. But that rhythm, take it a dum, take it a dum, take it a dum, take it a dum, is this sort of driving energy that pushes this music through. So if you like, you can do that along, or you could just sit and listen as we play Florence Price's Juba Dance. <laughs> Thank you. 
So in this next piece, we're going to go to a galaxy far, far away and a time long, long ago. And we're going to meet an intergalactic heroine with mystical powers called Rey. How many of you have seen Star Wars? You have, good, thanks for saying it. Um, right. I have too. Uh, how many of you have seen all nine films? Good, spin-offs? How many of you have got a complete collection of Star Wars toys with their plastic lightsabers? I think that's just me. Okay, so before we do anything else, okay, let's just hear the orchestra play the first paragraph of Ray's theme. There she is, in her first sort of musical utterance in the film. And if you remember, in The Force Awakens, when we first meet Rey, uh, she's sort of gliding along on her gravity-defying speeder. She's traveling around the planet of Jakku, trying to collect various bits of metal. That's how she makes her living, as a scrap metal collector. And John Williams, the composer, said when he wrote this, he wanted to give the feeling of adventure, but it's not overtly heroic, okay? So that's Rey in sound. But what does that tell us about her? Now, if you spend a lot of time on weird Star Wars chat forums like I do, there were all sorts of theories of conspiracies about where Rey came from at the very beginning, before we knew what the final outcome of the story was. And much of it is hidden within her music, because music can tell us so much more than we necessarily realize on first listening. Now, if I just ask Katrina on flute just to play us Rey's theme, just stand alone as it is. A beautiful melody, a simple melody, played rather beautifully. Now, if we just hear the first half of that now. And now we're going to hear that played backwards. Now, it's just those last three notes that become quite interesting when we try and dissect a character, because now, if we add that backwards version of Ray with some harmony in the strings, then we get this. If anybody really knows their Star Wars soundtrack well, that final thing that we heard then is called the Vader cadence. That is the music that always accompanies Darth Vader when he's on screen. So it begins to suggest to us that maybe Rey isn't all bright and sunny like we may first think, but there's more. Okay, there's a scene when she sat down talking to her robot BB-8, sort of wondering where she comes from. Who are her parents? Why is she in this universe? And we hear this music. if we just focus on the intervals and the rhythm of those last few notes, then it turns into this. Another perfect execution of the Vader cadence. And when you take your exam, you have to remember there are five recognized musical cadences. Perfect, plagal, imperfect, interrupted, and Vader. Okay? And whenever we hear that, we know that Darth Vader is never far away. It's like his little harmonic light motif that we can hear in her music. So, maybe, now we think that Ray is all bad. 
but there's hope, okay? Because hidden within that as well is the way her music joins seamlessly with the original fourth theme of Luke Skywalker that the horns will now demonstrate. So she is at one with the light side of the force, with strong undertones of the dark side, and we later learn actually she is the granddaughter of Emperor Palpatine himself. So it's all there in the music, all the clues are there. But if you were going to try and write that as a character description, that would be like a thousand words trying to go into the intricacies of who she is and where she came from. But we don't need words when we have music, because it can tell us far more than we can ever write down. So here she is in all her mysterious dark side, light side, galaxy saving glory. This is Ray's theme. So when I hear music, I imagine stories. Some people can hear harmony and structure, some people think of history and the color of the sound of the orchestra, but I always end up hearing a narrative. And I sometimes, you know, I make up stories and adventures to go with bits of music I hear. 
earlier on, that piece we played on my name. So I asked my friend Tim if he would write a piece that demonstrated how a simple melody could be orchestrated to tell a different story. And he sent it to me, and I was very excited. I didn't know he was going to write a passacaglia on my name. But once I heard it, I knew the words I wanted to say. You know, for me, that piece is like a film within about four minutes, just on one simple idea. But words and music are a powerful partnership. You know, if you work in advertising, you need to get the right piece of music to sell your product. And I wanted to try and explore that a little bit with a piece of music we're going to play for you now. So how best to demonstrate? Well, last night I was on Amazon because I need a new coffee machine. So I was thinking, OK, if I was going to take this description, these descriptive words of the coffee machine I wanted and set them to music, would what we're about to do now make you rush out and buy it? Make your coffee your way. The integrated bean grinder has a 125 gram capacity and 19 settings. So whether you love your fresh coffee weak or full body, there's a setting for you. Delivering 19 bar pressure, our coffee machines ensure a rich aromatic flavor with every cup as water is forced through the coffee beans to achieve the perfect brew. Does that work? If we were to put that on television, would you rush out and buy that particular coffee machine? No, definitely not. It just doesn't work, does it? But if I was to use the same music to explain to you why I need to buy this, well, maybe it would mean more. On Sunday morning, I went downstairs. I started to make breakfast for my children and I turned the coffee machine on. The familiar whir and grind as the beans were poured through the machine wasn't there. I was met with a bank of flashing lights and an error message. My coffee machine, my companion, my energizer had gone. So you see that story it's not dramatic enough. I need more dramatic music. I can't tell you how upset I was when my coffee machine broke. But that's how I felt, OK? It was a matter of great sorrow for me when I discovered this wasn't going to happen. But I need uplifting music to make me want to buy that machine. Now, what we just heard was incidental music by a composer called Grieg. He wrote it for a play by Heinrich Ibsen called Pierre Gint. And incidental music works like film music does. It reinforces what's happening on the screen or on the stage, often when there are no words spoken. Now, Pierre Gint, well, he, he, he isn't a very well-behaved individual. He does many things that are socially wrong, uh, and, and, and we shouldn't really celebrate those. But he is sort of all over the place doing many, many bad things, and he receives a message that he needs to go home immediately because the one person he would listen to in all his life was his mother. And the notes, he says, is you need to get home now because she doesn't have long left. And this happens in the third act of the play. There are no words. It's just Pierre arriving on stage as he says farewell to his mum, Orza.
Music that is painfully beautiful and yet painfully simple. It is simply a chord sequence, isn't it? Simple chord sequence with some cadences that never resolve, but they leave us hanging on till the final breath of Alza as she passes away in the play. Now, music doesn't need to be complicated in order to be brilliant. We're going to emphasize that with this next piece of music. This is by Beethoven. This is a movement of his seventh symphony. And we'll hear a little bit, and then we'll talk. That music, when people first heard it in 1813, they were so moved, so taken with it, that at the end of that movement, in the middle of a symphony, the audience wouldn't stop clapping. And they had to play it twice more before they could carry on. And it was almost a calling card for Beethoven. Everywhere he went, people wanted to hear that music. But that's not complicated. You know, long, short, short, long, 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 short, short, long, 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 short, short, long, 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 short, short, long. But bear in mind, this is a composer that really made a name for himself by going ba 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 ba. You know, he liked small, concise musical ideas. But it's an interesting thing that we have that shape, that music, but how can it be changed? How can someone else make it sound different? Well, I'm going to ask David to go and have a rest for a moment, okay, so I don't upset his artistic integrity. And I'm going to disrupt the orchestra. Now, I'm not the conductor, okay, I've got the basic shapes. This one's easy because it's in two. Try this. You go down, up. That's it. Down, up. But with that simple gesture, down, up, we can change the feeling, the meaning of that music. Let's go from the third bar strings. Wind, you can rest for a little while. Okay, so let's just refresh our memories of where we are. Now I could go slower. And even that changes the character. I could ask the musicians to emphasize the quavers more. That's a bit vulgar. Now we could emphasize the crotches. Let's go a bit faster. Now we've got this secondary melody in the violas. Do we want to hear the secondary melody though, or the primary one? Let's get the violas to play less. More of the seconds. Now less. seconds. Now carry on. Because the thing is, they don't need me at all. I can disrupt, I can ask them to lean on notes in different ways, but actually they can play this perfectly brilliantly with no interference whatsoever.
So at that point, you've got this sort of collective power of musicians all coming together, and they start to react differently. You know, if the conductor stands there, then, then the musicians will follow the conductor, nine times out of ten. Uh, and then there are moments, actually, the conductor does nothing. The performance gets even more exciting because then you start to get all those ideas coming through and you see people looking at each other in a different way. You can notice people listening and responding to what's happening on the stage. So there's like a hundred different ways you can interpret that incredibly simple musical idea and every one of them has merit. Now, the big heavy version we did, maybe not so much, but that was deliberate on my part to see how we could move things around. But you know, all Beethoven writes is allegretto which is a fairly vague term, you know, fairly brisk. What does that mean? You know, my fairly brisk is very different to my five-year-old son's fairly brisk. It's even different to my 18-year-old son who simply can't put his socks on in the morning that isn't sort of at a matrix slow motion speed. You know, everyone's interpretation of brisk is different, and that's how it comes into music as well. Now, I'm going to ask David to come back because he can actually conduct. He can do more than ones and twos. He can do threes and fives and all sorts. And we're going to hear now that whole movement of Beethoven's Seventh Symphony. But as you go away, just think how you can all contribute to that musical conversation.
So, Beethoven's symphony, if we look at it in score form, it's that, okay? What have we got? Uh, 113 pages, and that's about 35 minutes of music, okay? A couple of centimeters thick. And Beethoven tells us exactly what we need to do. Yes, we can interpret it differently, we can shape it differently, but ultimately, when we play it, it's Beethoven's music. And we just sort of bring that to life. Now, in the middle of the 20th century, a composer called Terry Riley wrote this. And this one page can last about seven hours, if we want it. It could last about five minutes, which is what it will do in a minute. But Terry Riley broke all the rules. He was the very first composer to be given the title of minimalist. So up until this point, music had tended to run in long phrases. In the Beethoven, we heard simple melody number one, and then the violas joined us on melody number two. And we would go in and out of those and develop them and give them different harmonies. Minimalists tend to just layer things, layer things on top, and it keeps adding to the texture, and then you might take one thing away and add more on top. It's a different way of playing. But the rules that Terry Riley gave us were, were they were sort of in fitting with the time, the middle of the 1960s, the countercultural revolution, when people were choosing to live different lifestyles, alternative lifestyles, wear different clothes, behave in different ways. Social norms had changed. Not dissimilar, I suppose, to how we exist now, post-COVID. You know, do we actually have to go into an office? No, we could work from home. Can we have an international board meeting wearing Bermuda shorts and flip-flops? Only if your camera stays above your shoulders. All of these things are possible in modern life. And Terry Riley thought, well, in the 1960s, maybe it's possible to completely change the rules of music. And so, rather than a Beethoven symphony, where we play exactly what's on the page, exactly when we're told to, in the shape that a conductor gives us, Terry Riley says, well, just sort of play when you feel like. If you get a bit tired, have a rest. And, um, you know, you don't have to have any particular combination of instruments. You could just use whatever you have there. You could have five people. You could have 70 people. It could last for 15 minutes, or it could last for seven hours. Okay? And all he gives us are 53 small musical cells, little musical ideas that can just keep layering on top of each other. All he says is that you should try and stay within about three cells of the person next to you. So you can play at any dynamic, you can play really at the speed that the piano is giving, and you don't have to play an instrument. Now, my piano playing is worse than my conducting. Um, that's saying something. But even I could play the piano part for this piece, because all it does is this. You just keep pressing C for as long as the music takes. And then everything starts to layer on top of that. And it becomes hypnotic. You're sort of drawn into this. And when there's a change, it shifts you. So we're going to take nine of those 53 cells and give you a demonstration of what minimalism sounds like. This is Terry Riley's In C.
Now that goes against all of our training, all of our instincts as orchestral musicians to play completely at random. All we want to do is play together as one. The first violins in a Beethoven symphony breathe together, they move together. It's like watching a chord of ballet. And then in that, all of a sudden, we disrupt them and say, actually, you can play whenever you like. But in this next piece, they're going to play together as one again. We're going to finish with music by a Finnish composer called Jon Sibelius. And you know, we began with a spring morning. This is music just on the turn of winter. Sibelius lived far north in Finland, a place where the seasons are marked by different lights. In the summer, the sun never goes down. In the winter, it never comes up. It means you have about six months of darkness. It's a very strange, unsettling feeling. Your whole body clock is a mess. And there were different clues that would tell Sibelius that this was happening. He was a composer that spent a huge amount of time just outdoors. That was his favorite place. Finland is a very beautiful country. But there was always a sign that the winter was coming. And that was when the birds would start to migrate. And over his garden would fly swans as they made their way to warmer places. And when the swans would fly, he would hear this sort of of their wings going up and down. And he turned that into sound. It sounds slightly more majestic than my impression of a swan. It sounds like this on the horns. And that, that musical cell, if you like, is what this symphony grew from. It was that one moment where he was sat in his garden and he saw the birds flying overhead. And it's a piece of music that the narrative is there. The words are there to be spoken over the top of it. He didn't write them, but it's how we hear the music. It's so powerfully descriptive. So here is a little bit of Sibelius's Fifth Symphony. So Sibelius would spend his long summers in the garden, in the woods, surrounded by nature. He could look at it all day, and he would just sit there, letting it inspire him. The tiniest movement of a leaf, the twitch of a bird, a ripple of water on the surface of a lake. He would look at that and let it feed into his music. But as the summer went by, you could feel a chill in the air. It started to get colder. And he knew that when it got cold, the swans weren't far away. And when the swans came, it meant that the sun would be gone for six months. So as the temperature dropped, as he prepared for winter, he would walk around his garden and, you know, start putting things away, sweeping up the leaves. And while he did, he sang a song like an old Finnish folk tune. And as he was working, putting the deck chairs in the shed and doing what you do for six months of frozen winter, he sat down, he looked up, and there they were. Twelve beautiful swans flying over his garden, and off into the distance. The summer was over, six months of frozen darkness was ahead, but he wasn't sad. It wasn't the end. And in Sibelius' music, the end is never the end. It's the beginning of something new, a new season, a new cycle. Maybe like your experience today, because now you've heard this. Now you know this, and that this is yours, and that it can take you anywhere.